yeah, let me introduce the Khan Collective. Um, the Dukan Collective is a feminist art collective of Somali women centering the voices of women and elders in our community and privileging co-creation and collaboration. So give them a hand. Hello. Thank you so much for your patience. I know we're running a bit late. Uh, my name is Fodi Ismail. This is Ayan Elmi and uh, we run a small feminist art collective in Bristol. It started off from Camel Me and Tapes, but Ayan's just going to go through and these are just kind of some of the kind of elements of around the work that we do. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm just naturally quiet, but I will try. Sorry. Um, so these are just some of the elements of um, the kind of key elements of the work that we do. So making a storytelling. So with roots in nomadism. Somali culture does not place emphasis on written stories or material objects. Instead, stories are told through collective, creative actions, such as weaving textiles or preparing food. Making together allows stories to be told and untold, made and remade, and ultimately inherited. Building with fragments and fractures through <coughs> displacement and trauma, many Somali traditions have been lost. We are engaged in a process of cultural recovery while acknowledging the many gaps that still exist. We embrace these fractures rather than trying to faithfully recreate a lost Somali culture. We instead focus on the acts of mistranslation on how past and present, personal and collective might be collaged together to create outcomes that resonate today. And we've got moving beyond cycles of rootlessness. Young people of Somali heritage often have limited access to Somali culture those who fled Somalia regularly found themselves trapped in situations of precarious survival with little opportunity to pass on knowledge, practices or traditions. This has led to a rootlessness, a sense of rootlessness that in turn, but also a literal rootlessness that in turn continues the cycles of trauma. We believe that reclaiming Somali culture can help to create roots, a sense of identity, shared experiences and belonging. In order to do this, we imagine our projects as spaces of reprieve, enclaves where our community can gather and regenerate. Um, and we also want to resist tired narratives. The stories told of Somalia and its many communities are often singular, focusing solely on violence and conflict. Yet the experience of being Somali can often be joyful. Life can be encapsulated by a single story or emotion. Consequently, we want to tell deeper stories that engage with the full, complex experience of what it means to be of Somali heritage today. So that just gives a bit of background about sort of like about our values really. And so in terms of how do we bring people together? Well, you know, we, we bring our communities together through everyday acts of storytelling. You know, since 2020, we've really developed, we feel a, like a foundational methodology uh, for the projects that we produce. So we focus on the everyday materials, practices that form, found that are foundational to Somali culture. That's culinary traditions, that's weaving, that's cassette tapes. So we really try and engage people in the materiality of everyday objects. Um, and then sort of each project really does begin with an with a everyday object. So we started off... Um, with, for example, using cassette tapes. So this whole uh, project really started with this, uh, the way in which cassette tapes were a really important vehicle for how our culture was um, kept alive, really, during the war and during displacement. Um, and so we, we're really, you know, we, we know that the displacement that's happened has, has had a deep, deep impact on our communities and we're, we're really just beginning to talk about that trauma. You know, it's definitely something that our parents um, have not talked about, our elders haven't talked about and so there's a kind of intergenerational gap that we're trying to bridge really through looking at these materials. Um, Ian's going to talk about like how we host, so this kind of, a key part is how we host really yeah so we kind of we don't really have many places where we can kind of reflect on the significance of somali culture but also to have spaces outside of um just greater society which 
can be quite harsh, um, which in terms of, you know, some Somali communities are kind of one of the poorer communities. Um, and there isn't necessarily a kind of place to heal, a place to kind of regenerate. Um, and we try to do this in kind of um, carefully kind of creating spaces um, that people can kind of reflect upon. Um, and also, it is kind of intergenerational as well. We, unfortunately, we didn't get to with our first project because COVID hit. We didn't get the elders um, in a room with everyone else. But um, our experience with them has been this kind of um, interesting intergenerational kind of moments where, um, uh, yeah, they can be a bit harsh. But yeah, um, so we, we kind of want to develop, further develop this in some ways. Um, and it kind of is about holding space. Um, there can often be pressures for figures uh, from underrepresented communities to act as ambassadors, bearing the responsibility of collective story. This pressure can limit the possibilities of exploring the small, personal, and often idiosyncratic experiences that make us who we are as individuals. Um, we believe that all should have the right to tell their own story however it unfolds, rather than be expected to carry the weight of others. We'll just play you um, a small <coughs> snippet from uh, our first project. <coughs> So this is an uh, image um, by the wonderful Stacey Olika who worked with us to um, a lot of the women were not comfortable showing their photos so we had to find alternative ways of literally having them in the room so they were present in that Arnold Feeney event like in the background in that image so that they were with us even though they weren't in the room but it, that voice is so beautiful and what we really learned from from working with the elders is a they all sing unbelievably well <laughs> like all of them just off the cuff have this really beautiful rich um re these the kind of a rich way of talking but also mel like their voices the way that in which they can just come together and sing. Harmonize as yeah, well. it was stunning, and it and it really made us think of the way singing was such a a core part of the culture that's kind of been lost in a way through um, through displacement. So that everyday singing, which happens, we'll show you a video later of uh, my mum and aunt in Somaliland, but like that everyday singing that just these are songs that were passed down, these are songs that they would do, but they're everyday practices. So um, one of the things that was beautiful, one of the women said, um, culture, she described culture as companion. So you're in, compa the culture is your companion. Like if you have that, and I think it was such a beautiful, that was so add, it was such a beautiful way of looking at Somali culture and the way that really Somali people do hold it as a companion, through the migration and displacement that's happened. Like, to give context of Somali nomadic life, we haven't changed, like, Somali nomadic people have been living in that same area, in that same place for 10,000 years. So we're, you know, when people talk about the Maasai, it's like Maasai people or any of those indigenous tribes in Africa, are, in terms of the lifestyle has not changed for 10,000 years. So you've got that, um, so there's, a, there's an academic called Dr. Ahmed Ali Ilmi, which looks at Dagan, and we're called Dagan because um, sort of Somali Dagan philosophies, he says, are a liberating tool from oppression grounded in the teachings of our ancestors. So he defines Somali Dagan cultural philosophies are indigenous African philosophies that encapsulate multiple bodies of living comprehensive knowledge. These philosophies are the founding pillars of Somali societies in as much as they are overarching principles governing Somali people. In their cosmological sense, the Khan philosophies are the common threads that connect Somali people to their ancestral homelands in Somalia and to a communal way of life. So, um, you know, and we, we go back to this kind, of, this kind of real communal way of life, which is rooted in nomadism. 
um, you have to work together, you have to work um, with each other to really survive what is like one of the harshest landscapes in Africa. But you know, we have survived with that wonderful relationship with the camel that always comes up. Like the cat, a lot of the songs you hear refer to the camel. The camel and Somalia are in, in linked. I think we have the biggest camel population in the world. They are absolutely vital to our survival there. Um, ah, yes. So this is our next project, really, which came out of that. Um, audible tapestries. One of the things we worked out when we were working with the elders is uh, Faduma, one of the elders, came in and she'd done this beautiful woven object and she sang us the patterns, like the, the, a song from the woven piece that she'd made and we, we, we kind of asked her about that and but they did a weaving song so it was like the we, the, we found out in our research with uh, trailblazers really how much the craft and art of weaving has largely gone like, unacknowledged because it's considered women's work. Um, so most tasks are like, in, in terms of how nomads survive, it's all women. Like it is, um, like they build the akka, they build the, the nomadic house, they weave all the objects within it, they do, like it's, it's unbelievable how much stuff, like, and we had no idea that all of, it, all of these kind of handicrafts were such a key part of Somali nomadic culture because it's been devalued really by us. Everything you hear about Somali culture is the poetry. Like we're in all, you know, it's, it's this romanticization and it's the men, you know, basically herd the camel, milk the camel and write poetry. Like literally, that is what they do, you know. And so it's like the big poets in our, and, and so there's a big deal made out of Somali poetry, but n not really, you don't really hear about women's work and women's handicrafts. Um, and so we really wanted to um, shine a light on that. So um, this is a quote from a, a research that was done in 1994 I can't, by Fullerton and Adam, um, and it says, in this semi-desert, the Somali people have developed a portable house called an Abba, which is in complete harmony with its environment. The land may look barren and hostile, but it contains all the necessary material for the Abba and its contents. It is a brilliant illustration of the economic use of limited resources an invention forced by the conditions of life and totally Somali in character. And yet the ingenious skill that produces these crafts has been rather neglected by foreign scholars and taken for granted back home. Okay. Yeah, it should I'll just show you this video. Um, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, but so this is, my sister was in Somaliland earlier this year, and my aunt and mum, my mum was visiting. It should be, I'll just play. Typically, with a lot of these um, weaving, um, there are a lot of songs kind of that go along with it. So Somali people have a variety of songs that are used during their work. These are work songs called Hersa Haulid, which they sing to pass the time and entertain themselves. The songs can be new or off the cuff. The melody or the words can change. There are work songs for every conceivable, conceivable activity from cattle, camel herding to milk churning to weaving. The kabid is the most valuable woven object for the apple, covering the top of the structure and is made from acai trees, which are currently in danger due to char the charcoal trade in Somalia. So it's kind of a bit of a back and forth at the moment um, where a lot of the trees have basically, um, which is essentially the material for um, a lot of these, um, the, the kabid, which is used for the um, structure of the house. Um, it's essentially industrialization that um, means that there's a kind of competition um, and also the reason why it's the actual um, why it's all dying out is um, because of that industrialization is just basically taking over these trees and using it for charcoal production um, 
and I think previously, I guess what it was, was that um, there was a real kind of protection of land um, that has been kind of lost uh, and forgotten at the moment. Um, so you used to have hair, which is like a tribal... So, you know, before you would, like, if you cut down a tree, your family would be exiled for a year from the community and you all of your earnings for that year would go back to the community. So you had... Trees were actually better protected traditionally by nomadic people than, um, uh, you know, uh, trees were really well protected, actually uh, more than life in a way, uh, because it was such an essential to nomadic lifestyles. But what's happened with migration and diasporic communities and people coming back to Somalia, and, you know, kind of, there's a real, um, I guess there's a, lessening of those connections to nomadic ways of life which means that there's not a value for that sustainable living and that's mimicked everywhere around the world so um, something like uh, five percent of indigenous communities across the world are responsible for 80 percent of the world's biodiversity so Somali nomad, nomads have been protecting the bio, bi that biodiversity of that area for 10,000 years and so when we don't protect tribes, when we don't protect indigenous tribes in the race for like modernization or whatever, con I don't, you know, when we don't really afford those people protection, actually the environmental degradation that happens and the impact on the environment is even worse on top of the climate change. Yeah, and there's a real kind of communal element to it. So typically what would happen is, um, uh, after um, a woman got married, the bride essentially would gather her friends um, in their home and they would have to stay there. Usually it would be from four days to up to a week and no one was allowed to leave until they had finished this communal piece of tapestry. Um, and they'd sing songs together and then that was essentially to kind of pass the time. But yeah, there's a... Um, yeah, it's essentially a, a part of the culture that's... Um, kind of disappearing, in a sense. Um, so this is, this is us when we went to Hawkwood, and we, Hawkwood, and we started learning the real basics of weaving. Um, we ended up having to, well, a lot of the elders in Bristol and in the UK were just kind of like, we don't want to teach you, we don't understand why you want to learn, because it doesn't have a kind of practical and functional element in Western society. Um, and they don't see it as particularly as an art form, um, but we were quite lucky to find Mahabo who, um, Suleiman, who is a, an artist in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and um, she essentially taught us some of the basics of Zoom, which was quite difficult, but she was really very patient with us, <laughs> thankfully. Um, I think we've kind of come, come a long way on that. Um, but we thought it was really fascinating the way that one of the oldest technologies like craft weaving is you know over 10,000 years old it's a very ancient craft it's this it was mediated by this very new technology it was really interesting the juxtaposition decision of using zoom to like learn how to weave you know it was really it was it was, it was hard um, and then just kind of I guess the practicalities of the conductive material we initially started using conductive thread which was just, it was this grey kind of colour and it just, in the really colourful tapestry, just didn't sit well um, and it wasn't very complementary. Um, so we then started using kind of copper as a kind of stand-in. But yeah, this is, the project has been a real um, journey. I mean, it's crazy that it kind of started from just meeting this elder who had this tapestry and was essentially singing from this piece of tap tapestry like it was a musical kind of sheet music. Um, and she had essentially created a whole song about our kind of interactions and yeah. um, kind of inter intergenerational discussions. And we just thought that's something that we want to do and we also want to preserve the weaving. Um, but also there are, you know, there's so many other elements of Somali culture as well like the dancing, the singing, that just isn't done by the younger generation, that um, we kind of want to be part of that shift. Yeah. Um, Especially as the elders are, you know, 
they are dying. I mean, our elders are dying out. These skill sets will die out. There's also the, the, the impact of climate. It's I mean, everyone knows about the drought that's going on in East Africa. It's been devastating again. And so, you know, we want to be able to support. So in that video that you saw weaving, that was a young girl brought in with my aunt from from uh, the Meeg, we call the Meeg, the de you know, the, when you're out in the desert, you're out in the Meeg, you're out in the wilderness, basically. So she brought this young girl, 17 year old girl, to come and live with my mum, while my mum was there, because of the drought. So that's what Pete, it's like this communal, like, okay, we'll take, we'll take family members and we'll help people out. Uh, but I, you know, so she she's a very skilled weaver, and so we paid her to do some pieces. And so what we want to do is, in that, be able to support young people like I am. I, I am in Somali now, who's 17 year old, unbelievable skill, nomadic weaver, but who, you know, like if we don't support the, the women out there who are really at the cold face of climate genocide, because that's what it is, like, let's call it what it is. It is climate genocide that's being committed to so indigenous communities all over the world. Um, so we want to do our bit to really revitalize this ancient art um, and, and tradition for younger people and younger Somali people especially to feel proud of this amazing like the ingenious way in which Somali people have survived for thousands of years and you know although no one likes muggle milk the camel meat you know it's out of fact you know no one likes camel milk you know all of this stuff it's like well this is how our ancestors survived like we have to really link back to that to um, really appreciate what what the, the how they survive for years and are this you know like just to get younger people to understand that and to see that the culture is a threat like you know if we don't if we don't maintain it if we don't support the people out there you know it will it will be gone you know because uh, it's becoming uh, you know it, it it already in Somaliland it is become unlivable you know so they it was already difficult. But, you know, so when people talk about an unlivable planet, I mean, we're acutely aware that that's been, our, that's been happening in our land, like where we originally came from for the last 20 years. It's become unlivable, you know, so it's like we're already living, like our, our communities are living on an unlivable planet. So we want to make sure that we really center those wonderful women who are, the, who are really at the cold face of climate genocide. And bring that, and but in a joyful way because they're beautiful and they're skilled and the songs are happy, you know. So it's like this is what's this is what's at loss. All this joy, I want to, you know. So that's yeah, that's it basically. Come and listen to some music. <laughs>